there are various ways in which sample can be selected from the population. The classification of these sampling methods is based on whether randomization is used or otherwise. In those sampling methods, when randomization is used as a base of selection of sample, those methods are called as probability sampling methods. And those sampling methods where other criteria than uh, randomization are used for selection of a sample, those are called as non-probability sampling methods. Initially, we'll see the details about the probability sampling methods. Now, whenever it comes to selection of a sample or selection of a few individuals from a larger group, human being is the worst instrument for that because of the various biases, prejudices, maybe notions, personal uh, likes, dislikes and so on. Hence, some soundproof methods are required for this. Randomization helps in bringing this automated the self-proof method. In probability sampling method, the selection of the sample is done irrespective of human own judgment. First, we will see the characteristics of the uh, probability sampling method. The important characteristic of these group of uh, sampling methods is the randomization. The meaning of randomization here means every unit in the population has equal chance of getting selected in the sample. It is equal as well as independent of selection of the other units from the uh, population. We'll see one example. Suppose there are 20 students to be selected out of a group of 100 students. Then each individual has a chance of 1 by 100 uh, probability and uh, thus this 1 by 100 probability is for applicable and is available for each and every student in the whole population for all the 100 students. In probability sampling methods, the resultant sample is the representative of the population as personal biases don't come into picture. The other feature here is in most of the characteristics, it is the, uh, the sample value correlates with the uh, population value. That means suppose all the students are arranged in the line of intelligence. They are uh, put in the hierarchical order or in the say ascending order of the intelligence. Some of them may be a uh, little higher intelligent than the others, whereas some will be uh, not so highly intelligent. But when one when sample is collected, it is, uh, it automatically happens that some of the very intelligent students become the part of the sample as well as some of the low intelligent students also become the part of the sample and thus the sample value matches with the uh, population value. Probability sampling methods are used especially in those cases where one has to generalize or one wants to generalize about the whole population based on the characteristics of a small sample or a few individuals. It is also used when a greater degree of accuracy of the parameters are expected in the research. Probability sampling methods uh, demand for most financial resources as well as time resources. Since the process of randomization takes time as well as lot of uh, procedures are involved. Before going into the details of the types of probability sampling methods, we shall first see the various types of randomizations, the various procedures that could be adopted for ensuring randomization. The first method for ensuring randomization is a lottery method. The word lottery is familiar to many of us even as laypersons. As we know in the lottery from the lot, one person or the required number of persons chits are selected. Exactly the same procedure is followed in the uh, lottery method in sampling as well. Imagine that one has to select four kids out of ten. Name of one child is written on a chit and thus ten chits are prepared. They are put, a, put in a container and mixed very randomly. First chit is selected 
and that child is considered as a part of the sample. Then like out of four the first uh, selection is done. The same procedure is followed till the fourth child is selected. Every time between two selections the uh, chits are once again they are mixed so that the pattern does not remain the same inside the container. Now here once again there are two smaller types of uh, lottery method. The first one is where the chit, uh, the ch first child after selection that that chit is once again put back in the pot and thus the once again it gets mixed up with the rest of the nine chits. It is once again the second chit is selected. If by chance it happens that the name of the first child comes again, then it is not considered as a part of the sample twice, but it is once again put back in the uh, ripper tire and once again the sampling procedure is continued. In this procedure every time every uh, member of that population or every unit of the population gets the equal randomization every time. That is the advantage here. The second type of lottery method, once the name of the first child is selected from the container, that chit is kept aside and only nine chits remain in the container and out of nine then the second child's name is selected and thus one one chit gets reduced in the due course of time. The first method in which the cheat was once again kept back in the group, it is called as sampling by replacement or unrestricted randomization. The second case in which the cheat removed was completely kept aside without putting it back again with the original group is called as sampling without replacement or restricted randomization. We shall see the second method of randomization now which is called as a table of random numbers. Table of random numbers is the result of a very long research and it gives a ready made table of randomized numbers to the researchers. When initially random number is to be thought by the researcher, his or her own bias may come into picture. This table of random numbers gives this ready made uh, database of the random numbers to the researcher. Suppose the researcher has to select 5 persons from the uh, population. The researcher can start at any number from the table of random numbers and select the 5 numbers that come in the chronological order. The table of random numbers is given by Kendall and Smith and it, they, it comes very handy to the researcher. The researcher has to just pick up any random number from the table of random numbers and follow the next numbers that are given in the table. You can see the uh, some part which has been extracted from the table of random numbers and you can see how randomly they are placed in various cells. So uh, the table of random numbers comes very useful for the researchers. The third option that is followed in randomization is the use of computers. In this case the computer gives the random numbers to the researcher and saves lot of time and energy of the researcher. The use of computers for selecting the random numbers is especially made when the population is very huge and a large sample has to be selected from that population. Thus for randomization either of the three processes are used and the unbiased selection of the sample is ensured. Very popular sampling method amongst the probability sampling methods is the simple random sampling. As the name suggests it is the basically use of the random numbers and the selection of the sample is done randomly without any prejudices or biases in mind. This method is very useful when there is a small sample to be selected. This sampling method gives equal and independent opportunity for each unit in the population to get selected. As we have seen equal means every member has a equal chance to get selected and independent 
opportunity to get selected or independent probability to get selected means selection of one uh, unit from population does not depend on the selection of the other unit. Thus the chance remains always equal and independent for all of them. This sampling method is used especially when the population is small, also when the population is homogeneous. And the third condition is if it is the, the list of the members of the population is available then this can be used to the greatest extent. Simple random sampling method has certain advantages. It is the easiest to use, not much costs are involved in the selection of a sample. Then it gives equal opportunity for every population unit to get selected. It is so simple that no prior knowledge about individual unit of the population is needed prior to selection of a sample. So one can administer this sampling method without much knowledge about the population units. The amount of sampling error that is associated with the sample can be easily computed in case of simple random sampling. Though this is a very popular method of sampling, it poses certain disadvantages. Many a times it becomes difficult to get the population list that means the list of the members of the population and if such a list is not available it becomes difficult to select the members randomly. Sometimes one has information about the population units but this method does not use any information about the population units Thus, the information that is available cannot be used for selection of sample from the population. Sometimes the population is not homogeneous, but there are certain subpopulations in that population. If simple random sampling is to be administered or is to be employed, then it is difficult to get the representation of every smaller group from the population and thus the resulting sample does not become the complete representation of the population. This error could be avoided by having a larger sample but in that case again the expenses for collecting data from a larger sample are to be incurred. From simple random sampling we shall move on to the next method of sampling. This is called as the systematic random sampling. There is a process of randomization but there is also a systematized procedure involved and that's why the name. In this procedure every kth unit from the population is selected as a part of the sample. We shall understand this point with the help of an example. Imagine that there is a population of 100 trainers and out of them 14 are to be selected. So we divide 100 by 14 we get the answer something 7.1 I mean 7 complete number and some fraction which we round up up to 7. The first number from the sample is selected from for 1 to 7 imagine that the randomly selected number is 3. So the first member of the sample would be serial number 3. Then the next person from the uh, population is selected as 3 plus 7 that comes to 10. So the 10th person from the series will be selected. And this procedure will be continued after adding 7 to every subsequent resulting sum. And thus we will get the numbers like 3, 10, 17, 24, 31, 38, 45, 52, 59, 66, 73, 80, 87 and 94. And thus we get our sample of 14 trainers out of 100. Now in this procedure you must have noted that there is the first number is randomly selected the number 3. But after that number is selected, the rest of the numbers, they fall in place like after 3, it will be 10. So the numbers from 4 to 9 will have no scope for being a part of the sample. 
that is why this is also called as pseudo random sampling the systematic sampling begins firstly by making the list of all the population units in the population they are arranged in a particular order depending on the criteria that is decided the criteria could be the first alphabet of the name maybe age weight or sometimes the scores obtained in the test given once this order is ready then every kth element from the population is selected to be a part of the sample now how does one decide this kth element there is a simple formula for this divide the total population size by the expected sample size when you have this division you get a fixed number that works as k systematic sampling has certain advantages it is easy to use easy to administer it is very easier to check whether every kth element from the population has been included as a part of the sample systematic sampling poses certain disadvantages as well since every kth element is only included as a part of the sample the other population units which are non kth places they do not have any chances of being the part of the sample that is why the resulting sample may or may not be the actual representation of the population traits due to this at times one can result into the bias sample and that's how the even the findings get affected sometimes the population is divided into many homogeneous groups and an individual sample can be drawn from each of those groups we will see this with an example imagine that a survey is being conducted of university students now rather than drawing a sample of say 100 students from the university the total students are considered across three disciplines arts commerce and science thus the total uh, population is considered under three strata uh, as per the discipline now uh, even amongst the arts faculty or arts discipline again there are two strata considered postgraduate students and undergraduate students so once again this faculty of arts is divided further into sub strata now since here not the total sample or not the total representation but the strata wise representation of the sample is ensured in the final sample it is called as stratified random sampling there are other few types of this stratified random sampling depending on how many stages are being used in the sample for example uh, from university when we go to the first level of uh, classification or making strata that is the uh, discipline wise uh, categorization then we reach arts commerce and science that is the single stage sampling so because only one stage is being used over here when from arts we go for example say for postgraduate and graduate students we go for the second stage of stratification so this is called as two stage stratified random sampling imagine that the post graduate students are further classified into based on the genders so male and female this will add another level of strata and thus it will form the multi stage sampling so depending on the need and purpose of the study the stratification is done the main level of stratification depends on the primary independent variable that is under focus in that study that forms the base and the further classification adds to the different dimensions to the core independent variable the stratification procedure here ensures the statistical efficiency of the sample it ensures that every group or every smaller group of the larger population has its representation in the final sample 
and that is how the sample value almost matches the population value. Adopting stratified random sampling also helps the researcher in finalizing the data collection procedures needed as per the group of the uh, sample. For example, if the researcher is trying to collect the data from head of the departments, faculty as well as from the students, then depending on the number available from each strata, so data collection method will be decided. Stratified random sampling provides an opportunity to the researcher for the inter strata comparisons and thus one can make the judgments about that. For example, how the approach towards mobile usage differs amongst males and females that can be studied. The two different strata are considered from the population. Stratified random sampling can be used only when there is large sample to be selected from the population. Because if one wants to get into the details of the structure of the samples, minor groups of the sample, that case there should be enough representation for every smaller group and thus the sample has to be large. The stratified random sampling process involves three major steps. The first step is the decision about the main independent variable on the basis of which the strata will be uh, formed. It is the core factor under study in that particular research. The second step deals with how many strata to be formed, how many levels of strata to be employed. And the third decision or the third step in the process is the exact sample size under each strata which is the actual resultant sample. Depending on exactly how does one employ this sampling procedure, there are two major types of stratified random sampling. Imagine that the data in a company has to be collected from the employees and the strata decided here is their subject of graduation. Now as you can see in the table, there are four subjects uh, they have taken, Marathi, Maths, History and Physics. There are total 100 employees and as you can see, 35 of them have been graduated taking Marathi, 20 have taken maths, 30 have taken history while 15 have taken physics. Now if this 100 we equate to the unit 1, then the proportion in the population of each of those uh, subject uh, as you can see in the table is 0 0.35, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and 0 0.15 respectively. Thus the first three columns they show the basic structure of the various strata in the population. If the same proportion of their representation in the sample is retained in the resulting sample, it is called as the proportionate or weighed stratified random sampling. In this case, the expected sample is of 40. So this individual proportion of every subject is multiplied by 40. The resultant sample would be 14 for Marathi, 8 for Maths, 12 for History and 6 for Physics. Now in this case as noted their proportion in the sample is the focus of sampling method and that is retained even as the resultant sample. As against this if the actual number in the sample has to be maintained same across the various subjects, then it would be 10 for each subject for resulting the 40 of total sample. But in this case, the proportion in the population is not retained and that's why it's termed as the disproportionate stratified random sampling. And here you can see the difference between the resultant sample size for each subject for Marathi it is 14 and 10, Maths 8 and 10, History it is 12 and 10 and Physics it is 6 and 10. And that's how the two sampling methods result into different two constitutions of the actual samples. Proportionate stratified random sampling is used when their individual proportion in the population 
has to be ensured in the resulting sample as well. Disproportionate stratified random sampling is important when there are small but important groups in the population. This sampling strategy helps in voicing their opinions in the larger population. Imagine that there are only two persons of a small group in the sample of 100, then their voice would not reach. But if they are taken into in totality or in the equal number of every group, then even their small voice would become large and their opinion would reach the researcher. That is the advantage of having the disproportionate stratified random sampling. The proportionate stratified random sampling ensures the statistical efficiency of the sample. It gives a good self-weighing sample. That means the mean of the sample, it matches with the mean of the population and that is why one can definitely depend on this sample mean for drawing conclusions for the whole population. This is also a very simple strategy of sampling to be adopted. It gives a real true representation of the sample along with all its minor details. This sampling strategy also poses certain limitations. In order to use this sampling strategy, the researcher should be well versed with the minute composition of the population. Just merely having the total population in view will not be sufficient. One needs to get into the details and finer details for getting the actual representative sample. In terms of cost and time, this sampling strategy is an expensive strategy, rather one of the expensive strategies because one needs to first spend time and energy identifying and deciding the strata and then deciding how many further branches are to be considered for collection of data from that population. One has to first decide the basic strata and the classification criteria depending on the independent variable in the focus and how the further branching of the strata is to be decided by the researcher before the final sample is fixed. If there are mistakes in identification of strata, then it is bound to make mistakes in the final representation of that group into the larger sample. So these are the some of the challenges that proportionate stratified random sampling poses for a researcher. As compared to proportionate stratified random sampling, disproportionate stratified random sampling demands less time because one doesn't have to spend time and energy in studying how much is the actual representation of the smaller group in the total population. Thus one does not need to know the constitution of the population in detail in terms of their actual weight of every group. So that's why it takes very less time. This sampling strategy also helps in the making the voices of the small but important groups bigger in the total sample and thus the data collected from them gets its legitimate space or place in the final data that is gathered from the sample. At times the researcher does not know the finer details of the population or finer uh, classification of the population. In that case, the disproportionate stratified random sampling cannot be used for such a population. Actual sample size is same in the final population irrespective of their proportion in the population. The resulting sample is not the actual representation of the population. So these are some of the disadvantages of the disproportionate stratified random sampling. But all in all, the stratified random sampling is one of the most rigorous uh, sampling methods amongst all the random sampling methods or probability sampling methods.
Imagine a research where a researcher wants to collect data from 100 architects out of the 4000 architects in the city. Now in this case, it is very rare that the researcher would have a list of all 100 architects and then he has an option of selecting the sample of those 100 architects from 4000. Such a list of architects can be prepared but it is a very costly affair. So these are the limitations of the situation. But the city can be divided into the geographical parts and then the parts could be selected as a sampling unit. When such a sampling procedure is used, it is called as cluster sampling. That one part of the geographical area of the city is considered in totality and then under that uh, unit or under that geographical area, all the architects in this case would be considered as a part of the sample. Thus, cluster sampling is used in the situations in the research where the sample or the population is distributed over a large geographical area, maybe a city, maybe a state or a country. It is difficult to have their list and that's why it is difficult to go for simple random sampling method. The list of population units is not readily available and it is very costly and time consuming affair to prepare such a list. When such a situation arises, the researcher goes for the cluster sampling. Cluster sampling is a very popular method of sampling in social sciences as well as in surveys. Cluster sampling comes very handy for a researcher when a very large population is to be studied. It comes all the more handy when this large population is spread over a large geographical area. Very less cost and time is involved in the usage of this sampling method and that is why it is very popular amongst the researchers. Especially when one has to collect the data in the field work, this sampling method comes very handy and used by the researchers. So these are some of the advantages of this sampling method. Though there are advantages, it is not devoid of disadvantages. It certainly poses certain limitations while using. Here the focus is collection of data from one cluster amongst the many clusters in the population. Now one cluster will not be exactly same in size and in terms of other attributes as to compare to the other clusters in the population. This is especially valid in the social sciences where there would be differences in the population strength of say every village or every city. So thus the resulting sample may be varying uh, in terms of the representation of the total population in some attributes. Thus the sample may not be a true representation of the population in terms of every characteristics or every parameter that is under study. Since this is not a true representation, there are statistical errors and there are sampling errors while using this particular uh, sampling method and that is why it is statistically less efficient method. Since the resulting sample is not the true representation of the population, there are sampling errors. Because of this, the statistical efficiency of the sample certainly goes down. When the population is divided into various clusters as per the geographical areas, it poses certain limitation uh, in terms like many of the times the two adjacent clusters may have similar features as compared to the two clusters which are very far away from each other. And in that case, if the sample is not properly selected or if the clusters are not properly chosen, ensuring that there are all these varieties are taken into consideration, then there are chances that the sample characteristics become lopsided and thus it becomes difficult to draw the generalizations 
after the statistical analysis. We have seen four major probability sampling methods depending on the situation that the uh, research demands, depending on the objectives, depending on the focus and the actual data collection scenario, the researcher has to weigh all the four sampling methods and take the appropriate judgment and then make appropriate choices accordingly.